One, two, three, four. J.J. Gordon, sort of like that Indiana Jones in that he's always sniffing out his next adventure. Yes, he is! He's always interviewing guests so he can have them on his show and they can talk about pop culture, arts, and leisure. J.J. has his flag unfurled and he likes his french fries curled and he's fun and then he twirls as he goes to meet the world. He will march into the rain even if his ankle sprain. Take a peek inside his brain. This podcast is called J.J. Meets World. Don't ask me to help you move. Just just don't. I'm sick and tired of it. And I'm looking at my producer, Tucker Lucas, because I have moved him more than any other person that I know, including myself. There is a non-zero chance that I was going to ask you to help me move some furniture later today, I, but yep. that's gone now. <clears throat> yep. I, I was like, you know, <laughs> whenever Tucker moves, which you seem to do like, Every two years, roughly. Well, for a while, it was like, I'm only going to sign a six-month lease. (laughs) (laughs) And sometimes you... Did you ever move within a building, right? Didn't you do that in that place you lived at in Moorhead by the library? Didn't you move from one unit to another unit? No, I've never moved from... No, I've never moved from one unit to another unit in the same building. Mm. I've just moved... I've just moved a lot. I've, I've had probably seven or eight different places since I graduated high school. Yeah, I think is probably the number, which I've, was 15 years ago. I've had two huge moves that I've done. One move was from an apartment to my first house on Ninth Avenue. And then the other one was when I moved all of my adult stuff. Because once you become more of an adult and you actually have furniture and junk like that, that move from an apartment in Fargo to Chicago. Oh yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. That one was a heck of an ordeal because I rented there's a company called ABF and they have semi trucks and you pay by the foot for and you can pack as much stuff in and then oh, they okay. put like a bulkhead door in and then they put somebody else's stuff. And then they figure out what's the most logical way to load and unload this thing. So the first person who loads is the last person to unload because mm-hmm. they're filling yep. it in. And sometimes they'll take a bunch of clothes that the Salvation Army is sending to another Salvation Army. Or they'll haul uh, you know, stuff that's going for an estate sale, or they'll you know, the back end is filled with whiskey. Do you got stuff? Do you need to move that stuff from over there to over there? Call ABF. And I knew signing up for ABF that the driver's not supposed to help you load anything, but it still is tough when there's a dude sitting there telling you how to load it, but not helping you with it. I could do that job. <laughs> you, you probably could. You probably could. And I consider myself a very good packer. You are. I've seen you. you, you, you your Tetris game is strong. Yeah. It's, it's very methodical, and I yeah. don't know where I got that skill. Although I will say... Having moved you mm-hmm. once or twice, yep. Um, your method of packing is really incredible because it's like <laughs> laundry baskets with all sorts of things in it. Mm-hmm. There's there's no like, oh, this is pots and this is pans <clears throat> and this is underwear. It's like, yep, whatever was in my reach when I was holding this thing yep. is in this thing now. Yep. And it's mainly because I have the best intentions. I will go and buy boxes and tubs and be ready for the move. Months ahead of time. For there's a lot of memorabilia that's moving with you. There's, that's a, very there's true. a lot of media and a lot of cardboard cutouts and a lot of multiple versions of Monopoly and <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> and and probably like a bat that's wrapped in barbed wire that mm-hmm. Phil gave you or something. Yep. It's chain actually. <laughs> it's chain. wrapped in chain. It's not like <laughs> Negan from Walking Dead. Um, and the only reason I know that is because somebody has memed it recently to me. Do you I, watch Walking Dead at all? No, no. What you did make me think of is I used to have, I used to keep an implement of destruction in my car, and it was a uh, like a stick shift out of like a like a semi truck or something. Yeah, that I had found just laying on the ground, and it was nice and heavy, and it had a handle on it for your hand to grip onto. And so I'd keep it in my car, like oh maybe I'm in a Like, I would ever really need it in Fargo, but I'll just keep it. And then one day, I'm with my dad, and (laughs) he's got it. He goes, look what I found. 
I can't wait to use this as like a weapon. And I was like, you took that out of my car. <laughs> he did. <laughs> what? He took, he found it in my car. What? <laughs> and then he just kept it. Oh, and man. I don't know whatever happened to it. <laughs> Tucker, I found these underpants in your drawer. Can you I believe know, I, I got a find like I this? I can't believe I found this. That's, it's, I think we all, okay, so let's face it. We all have some kind of a weapon yeah. that we have as a plan. Yeah. Some people have formal weapons. Yep. Like they actually have a gun in a lock box yep. under their bed. But then there's people like Tucker and I who don't own a firearm. Well, but instead we've our, got, our instinct when it comes to physical conflict is mostly to tuck and run. Oh, flight. Oh, absolutely. I'm absolutely Get flight. out of there. Yep. Years ago, I thought I was being chased by a ne'er do well in the middle of the night i had had quite a bit to drink turned out to be my friend natalie <laughs> so you and were right so i was right <laughs> and the next day as a gift two of my friends travis and phil went and bought an axe handle <laughs> and a- just the handle to an axe <laughs> wrapped it in chain along the top <laughs> and then drilled a hole through the very bottom and put the jankiest twiniest rope you've ever seen and then they took stickers and they put jj3000 on it <laughs> and it was my it was my anti uh burglar yeah you kept it like hung hanging up by the door yep just in case you never know yep and when jill would be home by herself she'd bring the jj3000 up to the bedroom just in case she needed it <laughs> which made me think like i'm gonna get hit in the face with this thing one day and it's gonna hurt so I still have the JJ3000, and Jill still takes it to bed when I'm gone really? for road trips. Yeah, I and doubt it's that effective in Jill's hands, though. No, it's it, it, ah, you just you know run at something <laughs> and hope that it connects. Um, really, what I should do is I should build, I should put two metal brackets on either side of the door that she can just put the JJ3000 in to keep people from being able Use to it as open like the a, door. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, right? Sir, I'm stretching while I talk. Oh, my God. The stretch feels so good. Does it feel good? Oh. So <clears throat> I guess what I'm saying here is if we, there's so many people out there who owe me moves, and even though I don't plan on moving maybe ever again, <laughs> I just want them to come and pack up a bunch of my stuff <laughs> and then unpack it just so I can, <laughs> just so I can, you know, I can get even. I um, never made you pack my stuff. No, but. Well, that's not true. I have helped you pack stuff. I know for a fact because I have handled that acrylic tape, that thing that you used to keep mini DV tapes in, and then I'd pull those out and then pop them into a bin. Do you oh, remember that? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I remember that. You packed and some it, tapes for me. Yep. And here's, and amongst, <laughs> probably, other, probably amongst dumped, some other things. Probably dumped them into a tub. Amongst some other things. <laughs> um, and I don't have any ill will about it at all. I'm just saying I've gotten to the point now where my back can't take it. Just stop asking me to help you move. And I know a lot of younger people like I associate on a regular basis with 18, 19 year olds. Yep. They're in line benders. Yep. And I know they're at that special age where they're going to be moving all the time. And geez, JJ's got a trailer and he's got a car and he, mm-hmm. and he can come help me move. Yep. Nope. Nope, that time for me is done. And I remember my dad saying the exact same thing to me when I was a young man, which was, I'm done. I've hit a point where I am done helping people move. I feel that way about sandbagging during oh, flood season. Yeah. I'm done helping you save your house that's too close to the river. Mm. Also, my track record on houses saved after having sandbagged is zero so far. So, like, you've saved them and then they've been torn down anyway? No, no, no. I mean, like, any time I've worked on a crew that was sandbagging a house, they, they, they failed. The, the hot house still got flooded. Really? Oh, yeah. Like, not me. Not you, no. But And it wasn't like I was guiding it. I was one of, like, 100 people working on these things. And I just realized, nah, I don't want I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. If I ever become a homeowner, I know I'm not going to be buying a house close to the river here if I'm here. So, yeah, I gave up on that. In 2009, when we had that huge flood, I was down on River Drive or River Road, whatever it was. But I was helping our good friend Will Block and his family who had a home I down w- there. Oh, did I was on that one. Didn't that one get lost? No. Oh, then I'm wrong. One that, did survive. Yeah, that's fully saved. Willie, oh, good, Willie and I spent hours in his home that had no furniture in it. I remember With lawn that. chairs playing 
Grand Theft Auto 3. Oh, okay. Then I'm wrong. Then one house okay. did get saved. Good. There you go. There we go. But I'm still not going to do it anymore. But I was wearing, I, I picked up a, a yellow, because it, it rained a lot that year, if you remember that. Mm-hmm. It rained, and it was muddy and awful. Just f- National Guard was out and everything. Yeah. It was crazy. State of emergency. And nobody knows each other, but they kind of know each other. You know, you become, become battle buddies almost. Mm-hmm. And so I had this yellow slicker on and i had a, a yellow baseball cap and so my nickname on the block was big bird <laughs> <laughs> and so i'd be in the middle of like directing a a pallet of like of sandbags in so be like someone grab big bird and so <laughs> i will still bump into people every now and then who call me big bird and That's then, awesome. And then I know instantly where I know them from. That's a great nickname. Yeah, Big Bird. <laughs> hey, Big Bird. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's uh, sometimes you got to enjoy those things. And that was the last full scale move I did was I helped Willie's parents move out of their place. Got it. And they put all of their stuff into storage or brought some of it up to their farm. And it was it's sad to see an empty home, especially an empty home that's been lived in for so long. Yeah. And maybe that's the thing that kind of hurts the, the most when I help someone move is mm. having to watch a place that they've called home, a place that they've felt safe or a place that they've got memories attached to to suddenly become this blank slate again. Yeah. Is that I mean, do you ever you ever go back to places where you used to live? There's, uh, I mean, I can't go in it because other people live there now. Right. But two, I have two different houses that I lived in as a kid, um, that I grew up in, uh, that both are on the same block in the Horseman neighborhood. Um, I miss both of those places a lot because they were they they felt like home. And when I think about home, I still think of those two houses. One was my dad's house, and one was my mom's. Um, and yeah, I have I've tried to self-diagnose why I've moved so much. Like if there is a overriding reason, I haven't come to a solid conclusion yet. But what I can say is home seems to be the place where you, you, you're able to sort of carve a groove into it that you are comfortable in. And you're like, yes, I could be here for a long time. And I haven't been successful at doing that yet at any place. Hmm. I've, I've, I've every, any place I've moved into, it's always felt like this will be good for now. And then, it now doesn't always last that long. And I, I, can't, I can't really tell you why that is. Um, I'm sure at some point I'll go, okay, this is now my home. Is the home you've been at the longest in your adult life? No, I'm yawning. You're stretching, I'm yawning. Is you it need the, some of this coffee. Is it the one that was right by Hawthorne? You spent several years I was, there. Yeah, I was there for a long time. I guess that would be the third place that feels the most like it was home at one point. There's a revolving um, door of roommates. Yeah. But you were a constant. Well, for a while. And then I moved out and then moved back in. Oh, really? Yeah. I moved out and moved back in. So, yeah. So I had the master bedroom when I was there first. And then I had the tiniest bedroom uh, and I moved back in because. Uh, that's what happens. Fortunes rise and fall. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and that's definitely a roller. Maybe that might be it too. It's, it's, it's not like uh, where I live has been the only thing that hasn't had sustainability i guess but i don't know i'm still figuring things out and i don't my one of my favorite things is moving into a place Mm -hmm. moving out of a place yeah no fun because you're saying goodbye to your memories there and you're packing and you're You're clean you're cleaning and you're not imagining the possibilities of, of what you could do with it and a new place is like a blank canvas when you move into it my favorite thing is the first night i get to sleep in a new place yeah that is i just think it feels cool but um, but that's not like what I'm chasing when I'm moving. I'm just I move out of a place when I feel like it doesn't suit me anymore. Hmm. I'm like a hermit crab or something, maybe. I just entrench myself, and I I don't like moving. I've even moved back to the same building I've lived in before because I'm like I just like the location. <laughs> I understand how the elevator works. Yeah. Oh, my favorite place that I ever had though was my studio apartment in chicago i that loved place. that little place that place I, was cool i love the fact that i was in a building with like a thousand other people and so it was huge so big it had a grocery store in the basement i of remember it. that and wouldn't have to leave that place if you didn't you want would to. there were a couple days where i didn't 
because that's when Netflix started to get big. And mm, I just go check mm-hmm. my my mailbox and Heck yeah. get my Netflix and be good to go. I really miss getting those discs in the mail. Me too. That feeling of of it arriving and I have a movie, a new movie now to watch. Um, I still get discs from time to time, but uh, not very often. Every now and then I want to give someone a DVD, but I always worry if they go, oh, thanks. I can't stream this. <laughs> Um, it's just a real shame. It's really hard to convince myself to buy physical media anymore because I used to still do it from time to time. It depends on what the content is. And if I feel really special, like I really like this movie, so I'm going to be a completist about it and I'm going to buy it on Blu-ray and I'm going to get the SD DVD version and all this kind of stuff. But, um, I like DVDs and movie and Blu-rays in their packaging that they, they're not beautiful to me. They're not no. a thing that I admire. They're not a thing that I would want to put on a bookshelf and look at from time to time. Um, the content I would look like to look at from time to time, but I'm not in college anymore. So you don't need to have show all your movies. All say, the place. That's what I used to do. Oh yeah. That yeah. is what you used, I used to do. That used to be my, that, those are my trophies, right? At the same is time this... though, you had a massive collection. So mm-hmm. I think once you reach a certain quantity, then it's like, well now we've got a wall of it and it's cool. That makes sense. Do you know what I have now? No. Giant CD wallets. Yeah. Like seven or eight CD wallets full of discs. And I still am mad at you, Warner Brothers, because you did that BS thing where you did a double sided disc and then you put the title on a little tiny ring. It's impossible. Yeah. That's so then not I had fun. to get a, I had to buy a labeler so I could label the jacket sleeves. Yeah. I think we talked about this before. Just write on the side that's four by three. Yeah. And you'll know you're, you're not going to yeah. use that side. <laughs> See, I have DVDs still, but I don't like watching them on a modern day TV because they distort everything. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look as good. So I actually have an SD TV that anytime I want to watch something that's in SD, I watch it on there because it looks the way it's supposed to. Mm. I just changed my framing ratio. It's not just that, though, JJ. There's still upscaling that's going on. No, there's not. Yeah, there is. Because I hit my DVD player with a hammer. (laughs) So it really equalizes things out. Um, so we talked about swords, we talked about, or no, we talked about weapons, weapons. we talked about moving, yep. we talked about DVD collections, yep. um, I'm struggling to find a really good segue. Well, the weapons, if we had stayed on the weapons. I know, but we got so far away from them. We got, I mean, I'm sure. Let's I, talk about I, the. Like, I know he has moved if before. You, if you could have any fictitious weapon, what would it be? Oh, fictitious weapon. Yeah, like from a movie. Or a comic book, meaning it like doesn't Thor's act- hammer. Okay, got it. Meaning like it doesn't if you could exist. have a weapon from the world of fantasy, I am well. Okay, and 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 also, I'm assuming that comes with it is your proficiency with it. Correct. Okay, you have the ability to use it like the character who uses yes. it. Yes, I would probably do Captain America shield. Really, I love that shield. I've been a Captain America fan since I was a little kid, mm-hmm. and I've always thought it was cool that his weapon is. A defensive weapon, primarily. It's not something you think of as an offensive weapon, but he is able to to use it as such. And I've always thought it was cool the way he could fling it and it would do all sorts dun, of dun, stuff. Dun, dun, yeah. Like pinball it around a Heck bunch yeah. of weapons. Plus, it's made Ooh. of vibranium, so it can do pretty much everything. Oh, yeah. I'd say the cap, Cap's shield. What would you say? Robocop. Oh, that's good. Yeah, and I'll tell you why. You're So you're saying he is not a thing. He is a weapon merely. No, that's the thing. Is Robocop the new one or Robocop the old one? The old one. Okay. Oh, the Paul Verhoeven Robocop. I would choose Robocop because Robocop is a weapon. Okay. But it's a weapon that can think for itself and has a little bit of humanity in there. <laughs> but then you wouldn't be the one utilizing it. I would. I would give Robocop his freedom. <laughs> Was he like genie and then he's just going to stick around? I assume so. I assume that if I give RoboCop his freedom, because if, correct me if I'm wrong, but his family's deceased? Yeah. Yeah, in all iterations of RoboCop? I I believe so. I think he'd probably want to protect me. Would you tell him to shoot people's dicks off? No, that would be his choice. (laughs) He can shoot anywhere he wants. If he chooses the wiener, Uh, that's fine. Yeah. That's his choice. His choice. So Speaking of genie. Speaking of... (laughs) Speaking of the Arabian Nights. Uh, Who probably came into contact with Vikings. At some point. Maybe Bjorn Ironside when he was on his uh, his journey mm-hmm. to find the, uh, was it, uh, well, I think he found the Mediterranean. 
he knew it existed and went out there, found it. Our guest this week is uh, a Renaissance man, a pre-Renaissance man. Yeah. Is that is I yeah, think it's a good term? Yeah. yeah, pre. But like when you think of a Renaissance man, it's somebody who creates and does. You know, uh, it kind of has a lot of very uh, is talented in many ways. Yes, but his talents predate the Renaissance. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. Um, his interests do. Yeah. Sure. I guess because one of his talents is bass guitar playing, which we don't really get into that much. Mm, but no. So that's well, not we pre-Renaissance. Said, I think we say we'll save that for another podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I also want to know, has he ever made a bass guitar out of an axe? He's not. Mm. I guess Maybe, I, we'll get I, him working on that. I guess that I should have let him answer that for you instead of ruin that podcast Maybe question. Maybe he's working on it right now. You don't know. <laughs> you don't know. Uh, Tim Jorgensen is our guest, and I think you guys are really going to dig what he's got to say. Uh, we also get our uh, our second uh, JJ meets world message in another language. I thought he refused. No, he's he thought that he thought we just wanted him to say what we were saying, but repeat <laughs> it in English like a parrot. <laughs> but once we finally got him to get just to say it, he does. And I think it was Norwegian that he says yeah. it in. Yeah. Uh, Tim Jorgensen, neat guy from the city of Perm, Minnesota. If you like swords clanging, uh, if you have an interest in the show Vikings, Tucker's obsessed with it. You find out during this is a podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, sit back. Legath of the Shield Maiden is my queen. <laughs> sit back, relax, and enjoy Tim Jorgensen on JJ Meets World. JJ Meets World. Hey, hey, hey. Welcome to the podcast, everybody. Tim Jorgensen is our guest today. Tim, welcome to our series. You're the first person in our brand new studio. It's got that new studio smell. <laughs> Good. <laughs> That's actually Febreze, but thank you for saying that. Sure. Um, I was eating Indian food in here also like a couple hours ago. So. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, and it's also the wellness room for this building, so occasionally <laughs> you'll have someone in here to change a baby or something. So Flu shots. Mm-hmm. Be mm. prepared. They actually... Uh, to we'll get into this uh, a little bit later in the series, but this building used to be where people would go when they'd sign up to be in the armed forces and get all their tests done. I so, took the AFOQT, the Air Force Officers Test, in here. Did you? And prior to that, I ate Shakey's Pizza in here. Yo, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Let's reminisce about Shakey's Pizza real quick. Do, do they still exist, or did the whole like? I think there are some some still out there. Oh, I wish. Let's start doing shows from Shakey's Pizzas, okay? Deal. Um, Tim, before we started uh, recording, we were talking about rhubarb. Yeah. And not many guests can actually have an informed discussion about rhubarb, so I'm going <laughs> to jump at this opportunity. Uh, you like rhubarb? Yeah. What di- what's your favorite rhubarb dish? Well, uh, the Tower City Cafe is uh, quite good at making rhubarb pie, and rhubarb strawberry pie so that's kind of where i grew up with getting into having that as regular visits out to my aunt near ariska north dakota uh but it also grew around our house seems to happen to grow around every house we end up in and presently our house in Perm, minnesota so i've been experimenting with versions to i don't know see what's what's great you know trying almond flour or, or roasting almonds and crushing them and putting them on top or replacing some of the sugar with something else or some of the flour with almond flour and trying healthier versions but always throwing a big wad of ice cream on top yeah so you've nullified whatever you've done <laughs> to make it slightly healthier yeah well the dairy plays a little role in uh from what I understand, uh, there's a, I think it's called oxacillic or some kind of acid starting with an O in rhubarb. That's not exactly good for you. But dairy uh, neutralizes that or crystallizes it even in your mouth. So if you take a bite of raw rhubarb and then take a swig of milk, you'll notice a funky feeling in your mouth. And that's that science taking place in your yap. Uh, <laughs> but I think that's that may have a... Uh, you know, it's a great pair to put ice cream with with the rhubarb. So why they go such hand in hand like that? You yeah, learn something every day, and I uh, just did. We had, and I, did, I didn't know about this acid until last year. We had a Swedish culinary archaeologist visiting us for the Midwest Viking Festival, and he was talking about how I should maybe 
cook that rhubarb in advance prior to making a dish with it or do something with it. So I've, I've started letting it simmer in water a little bit and then do a, do a rinse of that just to really? be a little safer. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I like the job title, Swedish culinary archaeologist. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's pretty yeah. great. <laughs> Cause like Swedish. And then I'm like, okay, I'm coming along. Wait, yeah. whoa, whoa. Archaeologist. Yeah, good chance. That's the episode <laughs> title, but we don't know yet because the episode hasn't fully <laughs> unfolded. Uh, so let's take a step back. You mentioned a Viking festival. Mm-hmm, yeah. Tell me all about it. Well, the Midwest Viking festival, um, is part of a combo festival. The Scandinavian Yumcombs Festival and the Midwest Viking Festival are held together annually in June at the Yumcombs Center in Moorhead. And so I'm in charge, uh, once again, of coordinating the Midwest Viking Festival portion of that event. And so how many people attend the Midwest Viking Festival? Uh, boy, overall, I think for the two-day weekend, well, it's a Friday-Saturday event this year, June 22nd and 23rd, but it's around four or 5,000. Holy moly. And so what, so I've been to a Renaissance festival. Is it the same idea only with Vikings? <laughs> uh, in terms of celebrating Scandinavian heritage from the Viking era, we, we try to be as comprehensive as we can with the activities and demonstrations. So it's uh, maybe a little less uh, fantasy and a little more attention towards historical accuracy, I guess, maybe okay, compared so to a renaissance. Well, it's like you show up, you grab a little map, there's some food vendors, there's some people, uh, you know, teaching a pillaging course. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I like to say that everything outside is going to be uh, Viking and everything in the museum will be all other periods of Scandinavia, although mm. you'll still find some Viking stuff there too, so... And so June is a fun time to pick that because I assume that the traditional costuming that people are wearing is very, very heavy and possibly wool based. Yeah, there's a lot of wool and a little bit of linen. And that's that's really about it. Do you guys sell the I don't know what they're called other than dish like dish towels with the embroidered <laughs> corners? I don't know why I associate that with Scandinavia, but I certainly do. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like the. Like the flour sack dish towels, yeah, I, uh, I, you know, vaguely, but I, I'm not familiar with that particular tradition. Okay, <laughs> I would like to get a stand to sell those. Uh, <laughs> and what's what's the name of that that red horse? Oh, the dollar horse, the Swedish dollar horse. Yeah. yeah. So I'll just I'll pop one of those in the corner, and then <laughs> boom, I'm, I'm a- accurate, right? I'm historically <laughs> accurate. Yeah, for for some periods, yeah. The dollar horse. There's a gigantic one behind the Stav Church up uh, in Minot. Oh, really? It's just, you know, it's like they're head to head, this church and this horse. What are they going to do? What? Uh, you know, one might pop up in Moorhead next to that Stav Church, too. <gasps> oh. And what's Denmark going to do? Throw up a windmill? <laughs> are they really? <laughs> that, well, I don't know. That's going on oh. this weekend uh, down in, uh, in Iowa. Elkhorn, Iowa has a Tivoli festival celebrating Danish heritage down there. So what what is your heritage? Have you, first of all, uh, what do you know that it is? <laughs> Secondly, have you done one of those uh, DNA twenty three and me kind of stuff? I haven't done the DNA test. It's on the counter. My wife got one for Christmas. We got one for our son uh, from another relative, and I just I need to do it. I think because that's kind of a ballsy thing to give your son one, <laughs> yeah, right? Well. To be like be like I, I gotta know if he's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, largely Danish and Norwegian with a little bit of German and French thrown in there for, for myself. But, um, yeah, like like those tests show you, you're often wrong on what you think <laughs> you are based on who immigrated from where. I know there's, there's a scandal recently. Well, I don't know if it's a scandal, but it was a whistleblower. Uh, someone took their dog's saliva and put it into this thing, and it came back. With results saying, oh, you're, you know, this and this and this and partly this. And so they were like, hey, this thing's wrong. You know, it did. It didn't. It's it's wrong. My dog is, you know, a German shepherd. And it says that <laughs> there's a lot of Norwegian in him. Uh, and then someone came back and said, well, it's very possible that, you know, there might be these B- weird bloodline things that <laughs> someone, follow along. Someone hooked up with a dog at one point. And <laughs> Let's face it, it's not like it's unheard of. Did you guys see that they found a werewolf? 
in Minnesota. Is it confirmed werewolf like Canthrope? So here's the thing. <laughs> my in my mind, when you kill a werewolf, it reverts to its human form. <laughs> Are we agreed on this? That's so, what happens when you kill a werewolf? One time JJ ha- and I had an argument <laughs> about whether the animal he had just plowed through with his SUV was either a wolf or a coyote. I said it was a coyote. He was like, that was a wolf. It was a wolf. It was definitely a coyote. And so I don't know if I trust your judgment on mm-hmm. whether or not this thing is a werewolf. It might just be a regular wolf because you seem to upgrade nope, canines. Nope. It's, a, it's the way that the neck is connected. It's, it's much... It's much longer so that you could be bipedal and walk around and go into places like, uh, you know, in the Werewolf of London. He goes and has Chinese food. Mm -hmm. Wants a big plate of beef chow mein. Yep. But have you seen this werewolf thing? Also, side note, before I get too far, uh, Tucker had this argument with me while I was driving in a blizzard to Minneapolis (laughs) to drop him off at the airport and then turn around, get back in that same blizzard and drive home. But now my car is severely messed up because I hit a wolf and it cracked my entire bumper. (laughs) And when he hit that coyote, um, it was pretty interesting though, because the coyote kind of disintegrated. Yeah. Like you were going fast. You heard different parts of it roll across the roof. It It wasn't like a one. It was like a large pop. You'd see it. And we went, uh oh, (laughs) just pieces and all. all I have hit two animals with my car in my lifetime. Same car too. the wolf. I hit on the trip with Tucker. And then I hit what I assume was an albatross. <laughs> oh, I remember that. I was in the car you for that were, too. Yeah, at, you at were. Rutland. And uh, I don't think they have albatrosses out there. And, but. It was a huge white bird. It was an enormous <laughs> white bird. And that thing too. Crunch. Yeah. Uh, and I was picking feathers out of the grill of my car for weeks. <laughs> but the thing that I did not know about it was there's a, apparently an old story about an albatross, like an albatross, was a bad sign. It's a Hemingway sailors. story, wasn't it? The albatross, uh, they, it, the albatross was like the uh, a sign of luck, I think. And then the ship captain killed the albatross or something. Yeah, and then, and then their the, ship went down, yeah. something like that. You're not familiar with that, Tim? No, it's not an age old Viking tale. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me of okay. So let's go with the Viking tale then. Do you know any good Viking stories? Well. um, not off the top of my head. Okay. <laughs> the last time you pillaged something. Just just say one of the plot lines from the TV show Vikings. I, we'll I was just thinking of the animals that I've hit. Uh, what if, okay, yes. Yeah, so let's stick with this. What have you hit? But, uh, <laughs> so, what if you murdered with your car? Um, well, I uh, two deer. One one of them with the, a 91 Honda Civic two-door hatchback. And mm. the other this March with uh, a Ford F-150. What was the difference There's between... There's a big difference. <laughs> There's a big difference. Although the Honda hit the deer's head and the truck hit the deer's rear. Ooh. Um, yeah, but the the head hit on the Honda pushed in the headlight and I never really had it re- repaired because it really wasn't that bad, I, I thought. And the truck, I got nothing. I mean, that felt like I was hitting a peanut. Mm. So I was chaperoning a drama trip last April. Not April 2018, April 2017. Uh, because I had just been in that high school's production of Romeo and Juliet playing with Prince. It was a lot of fun hanging with those high school kids for hours and hours. <laughs> they also had to cut down my amount of lines because I just wasn't getting it. <laughs> <laughs> so on the way home, we go, we see all these plays in Minneapolis, and we're coming back to Fargo. It's like 2 o'clock in the morning. And a deer runs out in the middle of the interstate and the bus driver doesn't swerve. He doesn't hit his brakes. He knows that the safest thing to do is just to hit it. And it was a red mist moment because (laughs) a bus going 80 miles an hour hitting a not a big deer, like a medium. Like I feel like instead of Bambi's mom, we got Bambi instead, which is really sad. But it just you you feel this slight this slight bump and we kept going on some kids got up and I was like, I was the only adult who was waiting. I was like, everyone's fine. Everyone's fine. Calm down, calm down. And I thought, Oh man, when we come to a stop, the, cause we hit it 
head on. <laughs> the grill of this bus is just going to be, you know, there will be deer hooves sticking out. It's going to be nasty. Got to. And then we still had an hour left. And the whole time I'm like, oh, I got to see what happened to the front of the bus. I bet it's gruesome. And I don't usually like blood and guts and gore, but. I so desperately needed to see how messed up this bus got. Got out. You would not have known we hit anything. There wasn't anything there. Nothing. Not a dent. Basically vaporized. Not the- a smear. Yeah. It was just red mist. Boom. <laughs> so that was. So I guess I've te- I have I've hit two animals. I've been in the vehicle for three hits. <laughs> because when I was a kid, we never hit an animal when I was with my parents. Which is amazing because we had a lake place, so we were driving in rural Minnesota all the time. Yeah. We had a black bear, though, that lived by our cabin, and that was terrifying. We also had a a guy who lived in the woods behind our cabin for a while whose name was Crazy Ed because Crazy (laughs) Ed had been squatting in a house. This is in Vergas, by the way, so not too far from your home in Purim now, Tim. Mm -hmm. Uh, He had been squatting in this old abandoned house. And the city eventually took over ownership of the house and the fire department, the volunteer fire department said, we're going to burn it down. It's scheduled to be demolished. We'll use it for fire training. So they went in there and someone had told Ed, you know, gosh, Ed, I know you've been living in that house, but they're they're coming to do it. They're coming to take care of it. So they go to do the inspection before they burn it and they go downstairs and there are animal skins like you cannot believe that have been like tanned and ev- like everywhere. And some of them very reminiscent of pets. <laughs> yeah. And then we find out that he is living in the woods behind our lake cabin. And he was a nice guy. What'd you say his name was? Crazy Ed. Okay. I don't know if the crazy is a given name or a Christian <laughs> name. But did any of your pets go missing? No, they did not. Okay, then, then you're in the clear. Yeah, any, which makes me think that maybe it was one of those. Did you have any siblings you've never told us about? No, Just no, Christy? no. But I did notice that there was a shockingly small amount of raccoons <laughs> about at you night. Took a sample, yeah. Like, God, the raccoon population <laughs> of this is this a part lot of more. This, this part of the state. So, per Minnesota. Yeah. Do they still make Tuffy's dog food down there? Yeah, yeah. You can, depending on the day and the wind, you'll smell Tuffy's or potato chips or licorice or whatever it's weird else. Is because going on. when I go into Perm, Minnesota, it's like if they're if it's dog food, it smells like you're putting your head into a bag of wet dog food. Hot wet dog food. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's awful. <laughs> but if it's a potato Hot, chip wet dog food, <laughs> potato chip day is nice but i also feel like if you're not in the mood for potato chips it kind of makes you just a slightly queasy because it's like being inside of a bag of potato chips Mm -hmm. now i've never been there since they started doing the aussie licorice how is the licorice scent well that it's it's nice when it's mild but like any anything artificial in terms of odors the closer you get the more uh, intensified it can be pretty overwhelming and then you're kind of like that's nah, not what i want it's like the uncanny valley of taste <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> but in right amounts it's it's great to smell you do you like that yeah you like those smells mm-hmm. my house uh i wish was sandwiched between a burger king <laughs> and, and another burger king, and another burger king. <laughs> <laughs> but one that serves breakfast just slightly later than the other one That'd be sweet. <laughs> Speaking of Burger King, um, there's actually nothing to do with Burger King. I'm just segueing into bad segue. I, I, want, I wanted to. I just realized I've been wanting to ask Tim a question ever since I started marathoning the History Channel TV show Vikings mm-hmm. oh, because yeah. uh, it's like Sopranos but with Vikings. Axes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I so I like the show a lot. Um, I also know that they had to take a lot of creative license. To fill in, I guess, what they would call, what they were referring to as the gaps in our knowledge of Viking religion or anything like that. So I w- would just love to get your opinion as you are <laughs> the expert here. You, I mean, you're such an expert that the Vikings football team films you as a Viking doing stuff, right? That's how big of an expert they, you are. In they Viking. did for a couple years. Yeah. Okay. What? Yeah. Let's go in. Okay. So besides Tucker's question, 
then let's double back to the Vikings. I guess we don't have any sports related stuff on this podcast. This is the closest (laughs) we're going to get. I guess. So my question would be if, if you have seen any of that show, um, how much creative license did they really take with what we know of Viking life at that time? Well, uh, I think my favorite component of working with Viking age culture is the material artifacts. So the stuff made out of metal, leather, wood, that kind of stuff. I like to replicate whatever's out there and see how it works, play with it and let the public check it out. Um, one of the more challenging things is when there's only a one or a few examples of, uh, artifacts from Viking age culture and how do you figure out uh, more about it or how it was used. And then when it comes to the intangibles, like, uh, like beliefs, then you're really in a tough spot, I think, to, to figure out what their culture was like. And we were just discussing that online the other day about, um, earthquakes and natural phenomena and rainbows and kind of how the whole Viking belief system or the Viking age belief system came to be, um, you know, with Ragnarok and the rainbow bridge and all this other stuff, how, how would you go about trying to figure out how they thought that these things existed and what they meant? Um, so to make a TV show that, that deals with that culture, I think, uh, you've got to take some, take some liberties with things, but there are some areas, particularly with clothing, and weaponry where they could certainly turn to uh, lots of original artifacts to figure out how things should look. Uh, that said, you know, they, I understand that they want to make a villain look like a villain and a good guy, like a good guy, but it's not, uh, they could do a little more uh, work on that end. And I, and from what I understand, they, they have been making progress with each season. Now, I've only seen season one mm. and that, that kicked off with the rudder on the wrong side of the Viking ship. So I kind of got a little, uh, bad taste from the get go there, Uh-oh. but as uh, it, you know, it's doing a good thing as a as a gateway. Yeah. Just like Hagar, you know, they didn't have horns on their helmets, but Hagar is getting you interested in Viking stuff, so maybe you'll crack another book and get a little deeper into it. And, gotcha. Um, so I think the TV show is doing doing it uh, good in that respect. So it's getting some things wrong, but it's getting some things right that haven't shown up in uh, Viking movies or TV shows before. So. What I glean from this is Hagar the Horrible is the marijuana of Viking culture. It's a gateway mm-hmm. drug yeah. Yeah. to other types of Viking culture. And in a in a way, the football team as well. Oh yeah. So <laughs> let's get let's get into this. So the Minnesota Vikings, their helmets are completely historically accurate for <laughs> Uh, but they, they fil- they filmed you doing some Viking stuff for cut-ins like during, well, we had a, a, always provided four people to be what, what I called gate guards. <laughs> so mm-hmm. we would open these gates that let the players and the cheerleaders out onto the field every game. And then we stood and guarded those gates. You know, our, our role was pretty much done after the game started, but we were always free to stand in front of those gates or go take a seat and watch the game. And, uh, you know, the, the team has their other mascot and we had one year of overlap with, uh, Ragnar, the, the long time running, uh, human mascot on the field. And, uh, then he was gone and we stuck around for one more year. Both, both years we did this was at the TCF stadium outdoors. Mm -hmm. Now they got the new stadium and, uh, the entertainment coordinator that we were working with has gone to a different position during this transition. So we uh, approached another, the new guy and said, Hey, do you, do you still, do you still want some historical Vikings? And uh, it sounded like they were pushing for more of a modern Viking look with what they were doing um, in terms of uh, design and letting the players out onto the field. I think they're, are they running out of a modern looking metallic ship now? I, or maybe it's in production. They they kept the Gawler horn, and I think that's that's a nice touch. But uh, yeah, our role was always a little tricky to figure out, other than opening a door and shutting it. <laughs> <laughs> it must they, have they didn't have you go in like axe like the opposing team at any point. Well, yeah, and then the, and the <laughs> the weapons uh, situation was interesting because they were fine with us as entertainers to bring in sharp weapons we didn't have to bring blunt weapons we we weren't allowed to use spears because they might stick up into the 
crowd's face, but we could bring sharp weapons, but as we're coming in the door with our duffel bags full of gear, if we had a Swiss army knife in our pocket, we had to leave it at the door. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, this is seriously, this is an authentic Viking age Swiss army knife. Mm-hmm. I need this. Uh, when the, when the Vikings would sail, their ships have a very distinct look to them. And usually, and I'm saying usually based off of a uh, Muppet Show clip, uh, <laughs> they had like a like a head at the front, didn't they? Like a like a serpent head or something. Oh, uh, they're yeah, often depicted that way. I I think um, those heads may have been part of a different ceremonial process. I mean, a lot of stuff gets thrown in the bag of being ceremonial when you can't quite figure it out. But there were these four carved beast-like heads in the ship burial. And um, uh, some think they were on a wagon. Some think they were in a march. Some think they were on a ship. Um, but definitely there was some sort of decoration at, at the ends of these ships. So if it's just a curly serpent tail, uh, like on the Oseberg ship, for example. But they were certainly on tent poles. There are three um, tent sets remaining from Viking Age Scandinavia and Norway. The Oseberg and the Gokstead ships both had these tent poles and those had beast heads on top and you, it's not always easy to figure out what they are and maybe we never will but they had ears and eyes and sharp teeth and a curly tongue <laughs> so did the did the vikings have any type of writing are people finding stuff well writing at runes and rune stones are the rune stones are really the the largest uh, group of uh, anything that the vikings were writing down and then those sagas came a little after the Viking Age to uh, document their their raids and pillaging and some of their beliefs. Where's Beowulf supposed to be based out of? Uh, yeah. You so know, is he but, Scandinavian? The, the Beowulf's not something I know much about. I'll just be upfront with that. I think I tuned it out after English class in high school. <laughs> I remember going to the Beowulf movie that came out. And just being like, someone wake me up when Angelina <laughs> Jolie comes out as, was it Grendel? Uh, Grendel's Grindel, mother. Yeah. Grendel's mother. Grendel's mother. Um, I know that Ragnar Lothbrok, as a as a quote unquote historical figure, is more has more in common with maybe like uh, King Arthur, in that the myth- mythos surrounding him is probably a combination of several different historical people plus just fabrications and and other things like that. Is that a accurate assessment of what Ragnar Lothbrok is. I mean, I, I know that from what I have read from my fandom of Vikings, cause I'm huge <laughs> into the show uh, is that th- maybe that there's some historical record of the supposed children of Ragnar Lothbrok, like Bjorn Ironside and Ivar the boneless and those guys that there, that there's some recording of people with those names, but is Ragnar at all historical or is, is, is he, I, th- I think so from what I understand, uh, but as for the character in the TV show and what he's done and what he's doing is all about, I'm not, I'm not sure. But wasn't there, is it true that there were multiple supposed Ragnar Lothbrokes, including one that tried sacking Paris, uh, who actually was re- like recorded as being named Ragnar, something like that. And some of the other deeds that he's ascribed <laughs> to him are maybe from other people. Is that true? I don't know. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Tucker so desperately wants Vic- Vikings to be historically accurate so he doesn't feel like he's wasting his time. Oh, no. I don't feel like I'm learning anything. <laughs> <laughs> there are things that are going on in that show that I was like, yeah, there's no way that's real. And then I read about it. It's like, yeah, that's not real. So they have uh, in the show, they have these seers who look like they're aged men who look like they've got mm-hmm. scarring over their eyes or some sort of mutation. And people come to ask them for to tell their future. What do the gods have in store for mm. me? And he'll only tell so much. He'll say like, you know, they give you a little bit and say, you've asked enough. I'm tired. And then he <laughs> holds out his palm and they lick his palm. And that was just a thing that the show threw in. They were like, yeah, we need something weird to happen here. So let's, what if they lick his palm? Good old fashioned palm licking. I don't need that to be real. I don't need mm-hmm. that to have ever. Plus I'm not a, a, a Nord for the most part. I am according to 23 and me, mostly, um, uh, Irish and British with, I, I have some, that's all in there. You know, if it's, it's all across Europe, so it's, it spreads, but, uh, 
I'm not a Viking, so I can't be like, oh, this is my culture that I'm le- learning about. Yeah, well, it, it in terms of the the characters and the and the chronology of uh, kings and and figures, the people uh, in the Viking Age, my my counterpart uh, Marcus Krieger at the museum at the MCOM Center was always good at that. So we would often go do things paired up together because I would talk about the stuff and he knew all about the people and uh, and that paired up well. So I'm so, yeah, sorry, I'm I'm out of it on on. Uh, but if I was asking you, is this an accurate sword hilt? So <laughs> then, yeah, okay. we would talk about sword typologies. But I did want to touch on uh, what you were saying with the the seer, because that's uh, that's kind of like this uh, these characters uh, Volva they call them Volva. Yeah, interesting word for a, a seer. But uh, these people in the Viking Age that had uh, these funny little metal staffs with little noisemaker trinkets at the end, like a rattle. And uh, into into cats and maybe wearing cat furs and skins and just a really, it's a hard when you want to make a persona and depict a particular uh, character or figure from the Viking Age. It's it's pretty tricky to to pull this one off. But uh, so some say there were these seers, some say there weren't. And but we're tr- finding some artifacts that are kind of like what what was this all about? <laughs> was this a a healing tool? Was it to scare off spirits? And uh, mm-hmm. so you never really know. But yeah, making r- copies of those iron noisemaker magical staff wands, that's that's right up my alley. Gotcha. So let's talk about the making, the creation of some of these replicas. Do you actually, are they, would you consider them replicas or do you make them in an old fashioned way? So technically you're just making another one hundreds <laughs> of years later. Yeah, well, there's all the all the different terms you can look at. Is it a what's the difference between a copy and a replica, and what's the third one I'm forgetting? Reconstruction, a shenanigan, reconstruction. I guess mm-hmm. that has original pieces, then things you've added to it to build it. Is that a reconstruction? Yeah, let's let's go through them all. Reconstruction <laughs> is what? I don't know. I just, <laughs> I just remember being a part of this debate once and thinking, yeah, you could think pretty hard on this, but. Um, I think uh, the big challenge, and I think what the public likes to see, and what will get you a pat on the back as as a living historian. There again, you talk about are you a reenactor or a living historian, and that those terms get thrown around and debated as well. Um, but let's let's take uh, turn shoes, Viking Age turn shoes. So the leather shoe you would wear. Lots of good examples out there um, to replicate, make copies of, wear them, and use them. So you can go out to your local leather store and buy some veg tan leather and go get it out of making this this copy for your shoe. And uh, that's a challenge in itself. And, you know, pat on the back for any Viking reenactors that are doing that. Uh, you can also buy them from professional Viking Age leather workers. And uh, But what, what I think I try to push people to do is to broaden their experience with leather work. So getting out there and learning how to tan the leather uh, and process it and soften it and, um, you know, do something a little more than just going to the store to buy your raw materials. Same with the woodworkers. If you can um, get some education going on for, you know, which trees to use, when to cut them down, and how are you going to split up those boards other than going to the lumber store to buy your um, your white oak to make your tent. And the blacksmiths too, you know, you can go buy uh, some some iron from the store and, and get to work on that. But you can also make a, make a furnace and, and start processing your ore from uh, an earlier state. And those are, uh, they're great skills to have. And those are uh, great demonstrations to have at any event too. But really hard to get some of these uh, bases covered. Were where, you where doing would this? Get that ore? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, where would you get that ore? Where would you get that um, ore? mine? I mean, Duh. so so then you have to go mine the ore with a pickaxe. I'm guessing like a dwarf, <laughs> or you do like our ancestors did, and you. My you, ancestors you, were super lazy. I was <laughs> saying, trust me. You leave that up. You leave the mining up to one set of people. You leave the the lumberjacking to one set of people. Everyone's got something that they do. Mm-hmm. And you just hope that you're not the one who's really good at cleaning out the latrine. <laughs> <laughs> because the diet at that time 
was a lot of wild games. <laughs> but seriously, if you if game. would you just you would just go to a mine somewhere? Well, so you know, mining it mining it's one option. So this divide between going to a store to buy it or processing it yourself kind of existed in the Viking Age. So you could trade for bar stock iron coming in from other parts of Europe, or you could go and dig out what's called bog iron. So it's iron ore in a bog, and on the surface of the water, you can see um, how that iron and iron oxide will, uh, if it gets exposed to oxygen, will uh, affect the surface of the water. You know how like you sp- sp- motor oil in a, mm-hmm. in a water, you get that colorful ooze? Yeah. Well, bog iron will produce um, its own unique ooze that you can watch for. And then you just prod around with a stick. S- it sounds easy, but... I think when I go home, I'm going to play <laughs> Minecraft. <laughs> just uh, throw that one out there. Our, our our blacksmith out of Holly, Minnesota, Doug Swenson, was just over in Sweden last year, part of the, the Viking Connection program that we've got going. Um, so he learned from a master smith over there and, and did that earlier, hunting around for the ore and forging it on a double bellow forge versus a modern propane forge or a 19th, 20th century uh, blower forge. I guess that's really a great way, though, if you want to propose to someone and make it matter. Be like, I forged you this ring yeah. that I... <laughs> Do you know how shitty it would look if I forged a ring on my own? <laughs> be like, here, put this on I your hand. I dug into a bog and took the ore from the earth. <laughs> now, a quick Googling has led me to this. Uh, this is a gentleman who asked on Reddit where to buy iron ore. And he is a uh, major uh, history major in his junior year of college. And he wants to take up smithing. He wants to be a smithy. And so someone replied, oh, look at that. Like within four minutes of this post with a lengthy post saying the the type of ore that would have been used in the early Iron Age cannot be purchased on the scale you're going to want. It is possible to purchase modern iron ore, which will generally be shipped as pre-pelletalized balls ready for the blast furnace. Once you track down a seller, they will want to know how many train cars you are looking to acquire. <laughs> Any number less than ten or so, and they would have no idea to, that they or they they will have no desire to do business with you. <laughs> so if you're buying less than ten train cars of iron ore, you you best keep walking. Is is there are are, are some guys that produce ore uh, in the traditional way and then they they take pre-orders so they figure out how many pounds who wants to buy this and then how much do I got to make mm. and then they chop it up with a chop saw or send it out like the the iron range of Minnesota is that do they really find iron ore up in northern Minnesota so There's could a lot you just iron in there. go up there and be like sit at the cafe and be like anyone in town got some extra ore <laughs> a little bit of ore I'm looking to score some ore <laughs> What other ores can you blacksmith with? Can you smith with? Uh, well, you know, iron is is ideal, and then you can you can add uh, carbon to it. You carburize it, and then you make steel. It just has a high, iron with a higher carbon content, and uh, you know the non-ferrous metals like silver and uh, bronze. Those uh, those played a pretty big role in, in viking age metal work as well that actually makes me think i apologize for bringing this back to the television show vikings <laughs> <laughs> but it what you just said reminded me of one of my favorite scenes in the first season which is when they've it's uh they've already i believe raided the monastery in when they've when they found wessex um and uh it's that the first time that they meet or no they're in northumbria and they meet english for the first time. And the show did this thing where they would let you know that even though you're hearing these characters speak in English, they're not actually speaking in English. They're speaking oh, in yeah. something else. So they would start in a different language, move into English, but you would know, oh, okay, they're just saying that's so why I know that. And then they couldn't talk to each other. Ragnar could speak a little bit, but the, the, the English were speaking like an old English and and what have you. And then after they murder the English guys, I think it's Roloff or Rolo picks up one of their swords and he's like, their swords are better than ours. <laughs> and it was that moment where I realized, Oh, that's right. There would have been like a first moment where after coming into contact with these guys and one of their swords breaks and then they pick up an English sword and kill them with it and go, wow, this sword is better. So is it was, would that have been historically accurate to say that the Vikings improved their metallurgy after finding metalwork in other countries? Uh, well, there, 
the premier sword blades were already coming out of Europe. Uh, the and I think there's a some good shows on on TV that talk about the Ulfbert sword. And Ulfbert, uh, it's a it's like the Nike of swords, you know. If if Nike was a elite shoe, <laughs> but so these blades coming in out of wait. So what? <clears throat> Reba, what should it be? I, the Vans. I, Keen. I don't know. Brother, what is the name of your sword? <laughs> Air Jordan. <laughs> it's got a pump on yeah. the hilt. <clears throat> Hold on, gotta get pumped. <laughs> so the sword producer and his name was inlaid in like a Tori metal Hanzo. into the blade. So it's got it's like your name in there. Um. And his were so good. I'm just assuming it was a guy. Could have been a girl. There are women smiths. But um, that there were knockoffs of Wolfbeard swords that were fake. Mm. Uh, but the blades could come into to Scandinavia out of Europe and then have a hilt fitted on them there. And they seemed to be far superior to what was in Scandinavia. Now, as for encountering uh, in Northumbria and finding superior metalwork there, I they haven't heard of that scenario. Mm-hmm. Tomorrow, technology stops. A James Bond like villain actually gets a giant electromagnet or something. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever it ends up being in the next Daniel Craig Bond movie. And technology disappears, it's gone. And so we're sent back to the Dark Ages, so to speak. You need to protect your family because looting has taken place. Society has crumbled. What sword do you choose? <laughs> oh, I've, yeah, I've just used a sword. I was thinking of using up my ammunition first. Yeah. <laughs> See, but that's the thing. Is we're, we're two years into this, and the ammo okay. is gone. Well, given the amount I hunt, I'd have plenty of ammo left. But Actually, up- the day before this happens, <laughs> we get rid of guns across the planet. <laughs> People go hand in hand, and we get rid of all of our guns. <laughs> And we get rid of 3D printers so no one can print a gun. <laughs> and the only gun that's left is an old-fashioned blunderbuss gun, and I mm. use it to protect our studios. And no one has remembers that Star Trek episode where Kirk builds a gun on the planet to fight off the yep. lizard man. No one oh. can remember that anymore. The first people to go are the MacGyver <coughs> guys who are able to do that. So you have to protect your family with a sword. So you have to, okay. I didn't know other Viking weapons. Oh, really? oh yeah, dude. Okay, <laughs> let's open it up. What would you use instead? Uh, boy, for family protection versus hunting. No, this is not a multi-purpose off weapon. Humans, if this I think is, is just for saying. humans, then yeah. I'm going with a sword or bears. But maybe you know, the, keep in this mind is the bear's this. chance to rise up. Maybe it's a bear villain. In yeah, maybe you know a spear was the most common weapon. Yeah, and uh, it's nice because that is that where the old ten <clears throat> foot pole. They can, comes they can from? be pretty long. Yeah. The trick is once somebody gets inside that point, you're really out of luck. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you've got a smaller weapon on your body. But I always thought that I would be strong enough where I could get one guy on it and then keep running and get another guy. <laughs> and I could kind of shish kebab. I'd be using nunchucks. Yeah. Those would be good. I, I, what came the, towards well, those the... Those aren't a Viking weapon, though, are they? <laughs> I'm saying if I were fighting Vikings. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'd get they inside someone's good. gear tip with my chucks. <laughs> the, uh, the t- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would work pretty good. Chuck it up. Uh, why didn't Donatello <laughs> ever attach spear tips to his staff? Well, I mean, I would I would say for a couple reasons. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one is that... <laughs> Uh, I think with a with a with a bow staff, uh-huh. I think he's using a weapon that's some a little bit more rigid than a lot of spears, which tend to have. I, I'm thinking a of, wobble to I'm them. I'm thinking of you know uh, what I've seen in kung fu movies. I can't speak for Viking spears, of course, but um, that the idea with a spear is more about just getting the point into someone versus a bow staff, which is about other movements that you're doing with it. You're probably doing movements with a bow staff that you're not doing with a spear, and vice versa. Um, Tim, accurate. Well, the, I think the spear being longer, I mean, a one-handed spear is about as long as a bow staff. Okay. But once you get into tighter quarters and you can use the leverage of these uh, ash or oak staffs to uh, choke or crack necks or break bones with the, uh, with leverage, then yeah. and you're not relying on that point anymore. Did people ever 
pole vault with <laughs> their spears, do you think? You need to get in oh, battle. You ever, into the center of battle? Yeah. You know, you take it, you run, and then you go spear down so it gets into the ground and what? Well, that sounds worth a try. We occasionally we do battle practice over at the park there, and we'll do you that. Get a lot of looky lose when you yeah. do battle practice. Yeah. Do you have any shield maidens? We don't. No shield maidens. No. Is that because their historical <laughs> veracity is hard is is not confirmed? Is that why, or is it because you hate we, shield maidens? We're more like, uh, when everybody dies on the battlefield, we have somebody, you know, the Valkyries coming as Valkyries and okay. sweep us away to Valhalla. Really? <clears throat> where we can dine on all the pork we want. I really wish Norse mm. mythology hadn't become just myth- mythology because it's my favorite. There's some, and, and story. going back on the earlier story, and this is a very short story, but it's about it, having one on the top of my head. The one yeah. I always like to talk about is the the ship made out of human nails, fingernails, toenails called Naglfar. And, uh, and, and so <clears throat> the idea is that the, the Viking people had short fingernails and this is documented in an example of their fingers being pressed into clay clay didn't have a big part in the viking age but found a clay artifact that shows their nails were quite short almost like they Stubby. chewed on them every day so if you died and you had long nails then they get they go to, towards the construction of this nail ship and once enough uh go to its construction then that's when ragnarok starts i didn't realize that that was the countdown I thought that, it, had, it was it was it had more to do with uh, the death of Balder and uh, his resurrection and and all that. I think stuff. you I think you had multiple contributing factors, and I and I could be wrong that that's the one key that starts Ragnarok, but uh, it it definitely plays a big role. This big nasty ship, and and a Google image search will get you some nice pictures. Blacksmith, <laughs> lumberjack, nail collector. I do not want that job. <laughs> be like, be like, oh, Grandpa's dead. <laughs> Quickly call JJ the nail collector. <laughs> well, I just, Woof-da. I just wonder, like, what do you? That th- that would do a lot of nails. I'm trying to picture Floki building a ship out of people's nails. That would take a very long time. It's an ugly ship. The ar- different artist depictions of this thing are pretty nasty. Yeah. yeah. It's it, well, it's sweet. I don't know how you'd make that elegant and child friendly. The idea, I'm, I'm assuming, would have been it had it existed to uh, instill fear in. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if there were many ships that they would just purport that's what this is, right? Like, like uh, mm-hmm. ahead of time, so that when you see this thing coming in, people who don't know any better go, shit, that thing's made out of human made fingernails. Out of nails. And there were, there were even some wooden toy viking ships one from dublin for example from dublin yeah and that no the vikings really developed dublin and cork into what they are today really after huh. raiding and taking over but you know it's possible these little toys played a role in the belief system like this this little toy ship is naglafar so you gotta cut your nails oh little mm. torvald look you, at that. You get those oh snipped. so they used it like as a lesson like if you don't cut your nails it could, well, it could be this is totally this is a total could be but <laughs> I, I i know too i when i was a kid and i first got into thor comic books that was when i really got into the idea of norse mythology and i learned early on too that there was this concept in norse mythology that their gods are not um they don't live forever that they do die after a period of time so after Christianity started assuming all these pagan ideas and rituals and trying to meld everything in. Was the story ever told to pagans that Ragnarok has happened and your gods have died? <laughs> like, did that ever, did that ever occur? Or was, was Ragnarok always a thing that will happen someday? And then the religion faded before um, they could be told Ragnarok has come to pass. Yeah. I don't think, uh, I don't think that it was told that it came to pass at all with the coming of Christianity. Christianity, uh, had a period of overlap like like Jesus and and the new god were thrown in with the others to see if he could do his part with fertility with crops with uh you know whatever they needed a god to do um there were some coins that were stamped with the thor's hammer and the cross on the same coin really there was a ring produced with uh, the valknut the symbol of odin on one side and then you could rotate the ring and there's a cross on the other um so you could flip it for whatever company you're in. Huh. 
I never watched, or I, I guess I haven't watched any of the show Vikings, so I don't have any reference for what Tucker's saying, but I have watched a movie series based off of Norse <laughs> mythology that I'd like to ask about the historical accuracy. <laughs> um, what do you think of How to Train Your Dragon? <laughs> Yeah, I saw it once. It's kind of tuned out of my head because we yeah. with the we've got a four year old and 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 Shrek is like all over. Oh, Shrek's all over. Oh, but. so I'm Scottish, so I can tell you about the historical accuracy of Shrek <laughs> if you'd like. I don't know if you're interested or or Brave. I suppose our daughter will get into Brave. I like, saw Brave once and I thought, nope, this isn't. Nope, don't care for it. And so I haven't seen it since, which is a lot because I like Pixar movies. I know that Brave Heart is incredibly historically inaccurate. You want so if you you've been to Scotland, I assume. Tim? No, no. Mm-hmm. Have you been to anywhere in Scandinavia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know why I assumed you'd been to Scotland. It's, <laughs> anyway, all of the imagery in Scotland has turned into Brave Heart imagery. So when you buy something at a gift shop that's got um what's that what's the, what's the guy the main character from Braveheart William Wallace William Wallace so when you buy something William Wallace it looks like Mel Gibson yeah. now oh sure and it's uh it's really too bad because that's <laughs> not what he looked like I thought I he was working know. on a Viking movie Mel Gibson with Is DiCaprio he? and he was going to speak Old Norse what really this was a couple years ago i don't know what happened yeah yeah he had to he had to take that time off to do uh the bear movie yeah the uh, yeah. revenant or whatever yeah revenant uh, do you know any old norse i know you know is it norwegian you know norwegian yeah okay I taught norwegian at sons of norway for a while but uh old norse i i have the books to learn it i haven't cracked into it been getting in it a little bit because of the our river ravens viking group we wanted to make some shirts and other things with runes on them um but no i don't speak old norse hey could you do me a favor and in norwegian could you say what's up bitches you're listening to jj meets world <laughs> i was just thinking thank you for listening to jj meets world no what's up bitches you're listening to jj meets world well no <laughs> what about my more pc version thank you for listening to jj meets world thank you for listening to jj meets sure. world yeah should i ask it like a question <laughs> yes yes please <laughs> it'll be all the more confusing thank you for listening to jj meets world i was kind of hoping it was going to be in norwegian, norwegian. <laughs> but, oh. uh, yeah. I that's, what, that's what i was hoping you did you know that that's what I was asking you to say yeah. in no, Norwegian? No. no. <laughs> we're hoping for a parlor trick here, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> it's really what we're, we're going for. Okay. Talk for at the po JJ Meets World. Ah, there yeah. You there you go. So we have international listeners who will really freak out when they hear that and go, yeah. So when I first remember meeting Tim was when I took Trollwood classes from Greg Carlson for video production. Mm-hmm. And you were the assistant, um, I think my second year, I think was the year that you were. Yeah, I don't know assistant. why I was doing that, but I was bored. But you were, yeah, yeah, you were hanging out with us. And, <laughs> but it was awesome because Tim would bring, he had this uh, like toolbox that he would show up with. And it would have like sandwich fixings inside of it. And he'd build himself sandwiches out of it. Those, yeah, they had kato salami for some reason. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that that year we did a skit called Kvik Lunch. Oh yeah, because the Scandinavian Fest was in town, and you had gotten, uh, you must. I think Greg had bought it. You had bought him a quick lunch candy bar, mm-hmm. and so we decided to do a. Uh, is that Swedish or Norwegian? It's a Norwegian Kit Kat knockoff. Okay, yeah. So we decided to do a whole fake commercial for quick lunch in Norwegian, and we brought t- and Tim would translate for us, and we didn't subtitle it, so you wouldn't know what we were saying the whole mm. time. But I believe it's it's Alex Davy and I. And uh, uh, he says, I'm sitting there with my bar of quick lunch. And he goes, Tog. And I go, Tog. (laughs) And then he says, uh, I say, there has been an accident. (laughs) And Alex says, I have a wound. (laughs) And I say, genitals. And then I hand him the quick lunch. And he opens it up and it's 
a Kit Kat bar with sardines laying on top of it. Oh, and he takes a bite. <laughs> he takes a bite out of it and he goes, mm, this is not clean. <laughs> And I say, how misfortunate. And that's the whole commercial. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Uh, uh, I was going to say, as long as I've known Tim, which is a few years after you, uh, you've always had dapper caps. Oh, yeah. These uh, newsboy style caps I've worn since high school. And in fact, I, when uh, Fargo North instilled a no hat policy, I took my my photo at home for the yearbook with my hat on mm. and slipped it into a friend who was working for the for the books so I could get my hat in the book with my hat on Hell yeah. despite a no hat policy. But yeah. Tim's I, not going to take it. <laughs> I don't know. He ain't going to take it. It's possible that there was uh, you know some pop figure that I was into. I you know I liked ACDC, Angus Young maybe oh, wore a little yeah. hat that I you always, you've always had something of a punk rock. I won't do what you tell me streak to you, though. Wouldn't you? As as part of you, like, uh, your personality, just, no, nah, I'm going to Pretty rebellious. My own version of that. Chosen selective things. Now, we've talked a lot about your Viking background, and I know we're short on time. Your family's probably picking you up any minute. But next time we have you here, we definitely want to get into talking about your bass guitar playing, oh, your music sure. playing. You know, you've been part of the, played with the Keller Brothers, uh, do you play with Johnny Lang as well for a period of time? Were you his bassist at all? Or no, just... there, it, that was a different uh, arrangement there. So the Keller Brothers, before I was with the Keller Brothers, they they toured as opening for Johnny Lang for a, some national tour. And then um, after I became a bass player for the Keller Brothers, then our manager was Johnny Lang's dad. Gotcha. And uh, and so we always had a good relationship. And you know, Johnny used to play saxophone, but... He used to sit in on a little coffee place called the Frisky Goat on University. It's now a laundromat, I think, across from what used to be Sun Mart. The Frisky the Goat. Frisky I wish goat. we still had a place called the Frisky Goat. That's yeah. a fantastic name. That's where we did blues jams in the in the late mid nineties. And he would come sit in there. But uh That could go on for that's a whole other podcast. There's so mm-hmm. many topics there. Yeah, I just into. I just play bass for the Blue Whalers now and we got a handful of gigs. The Fargo Blues Fest coming up in August, and we'll do that. But all yeah. right, give another plug for the Midwest Viking Festival. Yeah, Midwest Viking Festival, uh, June twenty second, twenty third at the Yemcom Center in Moorhead, Minnesota. Swedish uh, cultures featured this year. We're bringing in some great uh, Viking uh, wrestlers, games guys from Sweden called Telga Glima, huh. and we'll have uh, a fantastic uh, wood carver named Jay Havik from Seattle is coming. He carves the uh, Viking ships that they're making over in Norway there. Fantastic! So you can you can try your hand at that as well, and, and we'll have some other new guests too. But it's always around uh, around 100 Viking reenactors over there in the grass doing all kinds of stuff. So are, Kel- you, are Celtic people allowed to attend? Sure, sweet. Do you have a historically accurate website for people to attend <laughs> <laughs> that they can go check out your stuff in case they don't get to listening to this podcast until after the festival? Yeah, it's just a rune stone. <laughs> <laughs> it's got HTML on it. Well, we got uh, the Viking group, R- River Ravens, riverravens.org, and then Viking Connection is vikingconnection.org, and that's uh, a program run by the Historical and Cultural Society. That's where we bring in uh, Viking Age artists to teach in the upper Midwest, and then the uh, Historical and Cultural Society of Clay County, they have their own website too. So there's a few different angles to find it online and, of course, Facebook. But uh, this year's going to be pretty special so if you haven't tried it or if you want to get involved you can shoot us a an email too and we'll we'll throw you in some wool and and uh, find what kind of hobby you want to get into leather work woodwork blacksmithing textiles all kinds of stuff do you guys have a special deal with a dry cleaner for the monday <laughs> afterwards i uh we have a volunteer loaner rack of uh, tunics and, and outfits to wear and i am pretty much saying don't touch these i'm going to go home and and hand wash these and mm. air dry them because if you throw wool in the dryer mm. mm-hmm. i don't know who's going to wear that next so <laughs> that's you true. start with like a my guy size and then you end up with a child size after two or three years <laughs> I just get by the way though smaller. child being clothing being child size has never stopped this guy from putting it on that's true <laughs> i wear bibs on the regular, <laughs> all sorts of stuff like that. But we'll save that for the podcast when we bring you back and talk about your base. 
and stuff like that. So, Tim Jorgensen, thank you so much for joining us on JJ Meets World. JJ Meets World. That's going to wrap it up for today's show. For more info, including how you can help us keep the lights on by donating to our Patreon, visit our website, jjmeetsworld.com, or you can hit us up on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all the sites that you fancy kids are using these days. If you'd like to stay up to date on new episodes of JJ Meets World, don't forget to subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, wherever you consume the podcast that you love. And speaking of love, show us some love by reviewing us on iTunes. We appreciate a five star or six socks or whatever it is that they use to rate podcasts these days. JJ Meets World is produced every week by Tucker Lucas. You can find out more about Tucker's work by checking out www.moonbasemaria.com. If you'd like to get in touch with JJ, you can go to linebenders.com. You can even hire him for your holiday party. I don't know what day it is today because people are listening to this on different days. So I don't want to say I want to end it with like happy Monday because maybe they're listening to it on a Thursday or a Saturday or maybe the aliens are listening to this and they've got a whole other calendar of days. This is the type of stuff that keeps me awake at night. 